Right, while they're getting settled, I'm Sarah Adair. Um, I am with Duke Energy's Energy Affairs and Stakeholder Strategy Team based out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, as many of you know, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. That's a um, relatively new role for me. Um, up until late last year, I had the um, pleasure of working with some of our colleagues here at the Nicholas Institute and Great Plains Institute who organized the event today. So I just want to start by thanking um, the Nicholas Institute team and, and the Great Plains Institute team for um, inviting me back to moderate this afternoon's discussion. It's been a real treat for me um, to be here today and I'm really looking forward um, to this next panel. Um, so our panel is the industry panel, Trends Among Utilities, Generators, and New Market Entrants. And we've been asked um, to describe recent initiatives in the sector, including commitments to decarbonize generation over time and innovations in power products and services. Um, and I'll also invite uh, my colleagues here on the panel who will introduce in just a moment to um, reflect on anything else that they've heard this morning that they want to comment on. Um, before I introduce um, the panel, I do want to just make two quick caveats. The first is um, to say that my questions today are my own and the observations I make are my own, so um, they don't necessarily reflect any particular position that, that Duke Energy has. Um, the second is to, um, to just to tell you that in my new role, I'm focused mostly in North Carolina, so I'm far from the, the PJM experts in Ohio and Kentucky, so I'm really going to lean on um, my esteemed colleagues here to do most of the opining um, this afternoon. Um, so I'll just introduce them um, quickly by name. Uh, you have um, their bios, or at least most of them, um, in the, um, pa uh, the programs in front of you. Um, so to, immediately to my right, Scott Weaver. He's the Director of Air Quality Services at American Electric Power. Um, to his right, Kim Scarborough, um, with, uh, in, who's Environmental Policy Manager with the Public Service Enterprise Group. Um, to Kim's right, we have a, a, a Kathleen switch, so, um, and I'm relieved because I can pronounce this Kathleen's last name. <laughs> so, so we're joined by Kathleen Robertson, um, who I believe is Senior Manager for Environmental Policy and Federal Regulatory Affairs at Excelon. Did I get that right? Yeah, close enough. Um, fabulous. And then, um, last but not least, Mark Labs, who's Managing Director um, at Modern Energy. Um, so I've asked each one of our panelists to, to just speak for about five to seven minutes, um, prepare some opening comments, and then um, once they've all had a chance to get their thoughts and ideas out on the table, um, as has been done with previous panels, I'll get us started with some questions and conversation among the group, and then I'll um, go to all of you um, in the audience and welcome um, your participation. So um, Scott, do you mind if I um, ask you to get us started? Sure, that'd be great. Well, thanks very much for having me today. Um, first, a little background on American Electric Power. Uh, we're a large electric utility that operates in 11 states. Uh, seven of those states are within the FJM footprint, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, uh, and Tennessee. Uh, we got about 5.4 million customers, um, 26,000 megawatts of own generation, and a couple thousand more megawatts of uh, generation uh, through purchase power agreement, largely for uh, wind resources. Uh, we're one of the largest uh, transmission and distribution companies within the country. Uh, we have over 40,000 miles of transmission lines and uh, 219,000 miles of distribution lines. Uh, so collectively, that's enough uh, wire to run around the uh, earth 10 times to put that in perspective. Um, so we're having that large environmental footprint and large, uh, I guess, um, overall service territory footprint. Um, we do have an impact on the environment, which can be somewhat substantial. And uh, over the preceding couple decades, we've made a lot of progress from an environmental standpoint. Um, over $8.8 .8 billion has been invested across our system since the year 2000, uh, largely in response to environmental regulations. Um, some of the regulations we've dealt with over the years, uh, Clean Power Plan, obviously in a little different state, which we'll talk about more this afternoon. Uh, but the MATS rule, mercury and air toxic standards, uh, the CASPER rule, cross-state air pollution rule, um, 316B rule, uh, the coal combustion residuals rule, the ELG rule, have required us to uh, make significant investments. Um, but that has come with environmental progress. 95% um, reduction in SO2 emissions since the year, two, since the year 1990, 92% reduction in NOx emissions, and a 93% uh, reduction in mercury emissions. So substantial reductions in criteria pollutants, uh, substantial environmental progress. And along with that, we've also uh, reduced our CO2 emissions by more than 55% since the year 2000. So 
Um, we've seen our fleet transition over the recent years. Uh, coal has gone from two-thirds of our generating capacity to one-third of our capacity uh, here in the future. Uh, renewables have trended up from single digits uh, upwards by the, the beginning of next decade uh, towards 30 percent. Um, we're projecting adding over 8,000 megawatts of renewables to our system between now and 2030. So it's all kind of part of this transition as an industry. And you know, here we're talking about PJM and the role markets play and uh, how those are things are evolving over time. And you know, we see markets as a good way to provide cost-effective solutions, uh, both from providing the economies of scale as well as providing uh, a regulatory framework uh, for making cost-effective um, cost investments, both from transmission as well as enabling generation. And those have uh, have an impact on how we've made these emission reductions. So looking at a, kind of our transition away from coal more towards renewables, uh, we're seeing increased um, questions about what we're doing from a CO2 perspective. And uh, recently we uh, issued a report, uh, I have a copy here, uh, American Electric Power Strategic Vision for a Cleaner Energy Future. And the uh, genesis for that report was highlighting a new carbon goal for our company. So uh, back about eight years ago, we set a previous goal uh, for emission reductions by 2020. That was looking at, I think, roughly a 15% reduction from 2010 levels. Uh, we easily exceeded that. So we tried to rebenchmark ourselves and given that change in our fleet, what are we gonna do going forward? Uh, so by 2030, we've said we've made a 60% reduction in emissions. And by 2050, an 80% reduction in emissions. And that's um, more or less consistent with some of the longer decarbonization frameworks you see. Um, that's a product of several factors. One, our continued investment in renewable energy, but also um, the aging uh, nature of our fossil fleet. Um, by the year 2030, um, over half of our fossil fleet uh, will be over 50 years of age. Uh, 60 years is kind of a good benchmark for expected useful life. So as that generation uh, ages, um, it gets near the end of its useful life, we'll be shutting that generation down and replacing with cleaner resources, uh, renewables, as well as highly efficient natural gas. Um, and largely, that's just due to an economic story. Renewables are coming more cost effective, uh, natural gas is as well, and uh, coal freight frankly can't compete, at least new coal in the current marketplace. So with those carbon targets, there are some uncertainties around uh, technologies, both from a carbon reduction standpoint, um, as well as um, you know, some uncertainties in our forecasting. Um, the penetration of electric vehicles is gonna be key. Um, how much support are we required as an industry to provide for electric vehicles um, and electrification? Obviously, there's a uh, competing influence in terms of energy efficiency. As the system becomes more efficient, we'll need less electricity to support that. Uh, the role of energy storage in enabling renewable technologies. And then looking towards economic solutions for 24-7 generation. So not just thinking about current fleet, but the new fleet and do things like nuclear and carbon capture and storage come back into the mix to provide 24-7 um, um, base load generation uh, that's not intermittent. So. Um, we're going to look to see how those factors um, play out, but we're really excited about our carbon goal and looking forward to our discussion today. Thanks, Scott. Kim? Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, PSENG is a diversified company headquartered in Newark, New Jersey. Our utility arm, PSENG, is New Jersey's largest provider of electric and gas service, serving approximately 2.2 million electric customers and 1.8 million gas customers. Uh, we also have a, a power division that owns and operates a diverse fleet of power plants with approximately 10,600 uh, megawatts of generated capacity located primarily in the mid-Atlantic states and northeast regions. And we also have solar facilities with, throughout the United States. As a company, we've been factoring climate change into our business decisions and investments since the uh, early 1990s. And we have established numerous uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals in the past and we've successfully met them and actually we just announced our new greenhouse gas goal earlier this year that incorporates some of the new things that we're looking at to um, also reduce greenhouse gases so our new goal is to eliminate 13 million metric tons of co2 emissions from 2005 levels by 2030 <coughs> included in this is avoided emissions from our post 2005 nuclear uprates retirement of our coal facilities in New Jersey and Connecticut, efficiency upgrades at our existing natural gas combined cycle fleet, solar and energy investments and programs, and included in that is uh, under the uh, utility arm, we have two separate programs. 
the Solar for All, which is a 158 megawatt grid connected capacity program. We currently have 124 megawatts built and the total investment, including um, what's been built and what we are estimating building in the future is approximately 1 billion. Our solar low pro loan program is 177.5 megawatt program that is targeted to businesses and homeowners that need financing for solar. Uh, to date, we've granted approximately 265 million for 13,000, um, 1,300 customers and financing 95 megawatts. We've been very supportive um, on the interconnection policies for distributed energy resources. And to date, uh, we have approximately 1,000 megawatts of solar installed in our territory. And the process takes no longer than 10 to 20 business days. Uh, we also have our PSEG uh, power side, our solar source, and that's outside our territory. And we have 23 uh, utility scale solar facilities in 14 states with a total capacity of 414 megawatts. To date, uh, the total investment is approximately 800 million. Under our energy efficiency programs, we have approximately spent or invested 400 million for our hospital programs, residential whole house, direct install for small businesses, governments, and nonprofits, as well as residential multifamily. And in 2017, the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities approved an additional 69 million. Um, that includes those programs as well as programs for start smart thermostats and residential data analytics. Um, we definitely believe it, in New Jersey that we can do more, but we definitely need a new regulatory compact in order to encourage utilities to do more. Um, we see through the clean energy bill that was approved by both the Senate and the Assembly in New Jersey that there is an energy efficiency of portfolio standard with annual savings of 2% for electric usage and 0.75% gas use usage. And we believe that vision definitely supports um, what we believe is critical to meet the greenhouse gas goals in New Jersey. Uh, we also have a, a methane replacement program for our pipelines. Um, our gas system modernization plan uh, that was approved um, several years ago, we're replacing up to 510 miles of cast iron and unprotected steel gas mains and 30, 38,000 service lines between 2016 and 2019. Uh, we filed our GSMP part two, our next stage, and the parties agreed to replace up to 875 miles over five year period at a price of approximately 1.875 billion. We've also have programs um, for electric vehicles. Currently, we've spent approximately 800,000 um, to install approximately um, 200 charging stations. We do have an employee workplace charging program with 45 chargers throughout our PSEG facilities. We also have a customer workplace charging program where we've installed 135 charges at approximately 23 hospital colleges and businesses. We've also partnered with uh, uh, EVGO to install fast charging at five rest areas at New Jersey Transit and the Garden State Parkway. Uh, we have a lot of activities that are going on in New Jersey. Uh, Obviously, New Jersey is in the process of trying to negotiate back into Reggie. That's something that we've been supportive of. Uh, we do have concerns regarding leakage, but um, we believe working with the department and the BPU, uh, hopefully those are some issues that we can definitely address. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathleen? Great. Thank you. Um, hopefully my microphone also works on the desk because it fell off on the way up. <laughs> Um, I am here for, uh, representing Exelon. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are also a diversified energy company. Um, our genera generation side has about 33 gigawatts of generating capacity. Um, altogether, um, our six utilities throughout PJM, including Pepco right here, um, serve about 10 million customers, which represents around 25 million people, so a decent chunk of PJM. Um, as far as starting with the kind of our internal initiatives, um, there are three essentially three major initiatives that frame our comments here. Um, our first, around, also around electrification and electric vehicles. Um, this is a large priority of the utilities right now. Um, we are midway through a $25 billion grid modern, that's billion with a B, grid modernization um, plan, largely or partially to support um, the expected 
deployment of electrification and electric vehicles and to get the grid up to modern standards, particularly with an eye on that as given the important role that, that, um, that electrification has in decarbonization. Um, within, um, within our territories, we have a number of electric vehicle filings of working to make that more accessible to the customers. Thank you, Commissioner Phillips, who, who teed that one up. Um, and as, as well as a broader opportunity for what Commissioner Powelson referred to as the reindustrialization. Um, and this is the electrification is the chance to do it clean, green. Um, so we are trying to be trying to support our utilities and our customers as they ask for that. Um, in addition to passenger cars, we are also working with SEPTA, um, Commissioner Place, I'm sure you've ridden in that bus, um, where we are working to electrify the, some buses in the SEPTA fleet as they are they're a good use of electrified vehicles. Um, within our, so within our operation, or in, within our generation, um, we, are the, we are the cleanest of the major investor-owned utilities, and we make more than twice as much emission-free electricity as any other company in the US. So with our big GHG goal announced recently, um, I didn't bring a copy, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize we got props. Um, we announced what a greenhouse gas reduction goal for our operations of 15% by 2020. And just to clarify, um, given how clean our fleet is, um, in, this, in this iteration of our greenhouse gas goal, this is our third one now, um, we're focusing on our own operations. So this is things like our own vehicle fleet as part of the utility service crews, um, natural gas and electric system leaks, our own office buildings. This is sort of looking in-house at this one because we've made so much progress on the generation fleet. Um, we also have a corporate investment arm, or sort of our, like, essentially our own um, investor fund internally, um, where we, we try to align investments with where we think there's a gap between what our customers want as far as technology and what's actually already, what's currently in the market. Or my favorite example of this is Proterra. We were an early investor and we st are still a major investor um, in Proterra, which has happily turned out to be one of the best electric buses on the market and really filled a niche there. Um, we are also an early and large <laughs> investor in um, net power, which is an innovative use of natural gas and an emission-free generation generation application. Um, and however, as proud as I am of all of these things, and they're all very exciting, um, we do need market signals to lower the emission rate of our generation or our company any further. And actually, our rate is only going to go up as nuclear units retire um, as a absent policy changes. Um, so that's what we're doing. So that's, you know, so we've, we've essentially done a lot. We're planning to do a lot internally. Um, but really where we can... We're also working at a policy level to support policies that get us to that mid-century decarbonization goal that we're not currently on track for. Um, and that is, that is just going to require the internalizing the use, internalizing the cost of carbon in the energy markets. Um, to set a little bit of context, I, I really enjoyed some of the history lessons today, and it really will put some of this in context, is we, the late 90s have been referred to as essentially the formation of PJM and the heyday of, you know, kind of these new market structures to to address the cost of electricity generation and delivery. Um, it was also the heyday of environmental policy. So I think in some ways that was good and bad is that a lot of the, the RTOs were formed and we, we deregulated these markets in the expectation that the federal government was gonna take care of environmental policy. Um, the same time of all RTOs forming was also the same time we started um, our, the first market-based uh, environmental policy program through the acid rain program. Um, which was intended by the drafters to be a mod model for a carbon program. It would be a great one. <laughs> um, but it, during the 90s, you also saw you know, the first, first PM 2.5 standards, um, a lot of development around rationalizing the Clean Air Act and making it more applicable to electricity generation and these other big sources. Um, so I, I don't think that people were wrong to think that these prices would be set and that the RTOs would then properly solve for the cheapest generation, or least cost is probably a better way to put that. Um, but that hasn't happened, as I think a number of speakers have spoken to today. Um, so as far as what, what should happen since we missed that, that opportunity, um, we, I can't say early or often enough that a national price, either through a tax or a fee or a cap, would be the most effective and efficient. In um, that way, we could just let the, market, let the electricity markets run and have that already baked in. 
However, in the absence of federal action, which is where we find ourselves now, um, states and regional partnerships are taking a variety of approaches to doing so themselves. And they really are taking quite the variety of approaches. Um, I think we've touched on most of these today, so I won't explain them. Let me know if you have questions during the Q&A. But we've got the you know, renewable portfolio standards, um, which are now transitioning to essentially clean energy standards. They have the currency of the RECs and the ZECs are the big ones. Um, we've got the regional, regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and their much neglected cousins, the Western Climate Initiative and the Midwestern Greenhouse Gas Reduction Accord. Um, direct emissions performance standards, particularly on CO2, California has some, New York is considering them. Uh, New England has tried through the IMAP process, but is uh, essentially s settling for accommodating state policy through the CASPER process. Um, California ISO is probably the most directly having dealt with this as their major state has AB32, so they already have a carbon price. And actually, PJM has explored carbon pricing. Um, they released a number of white papers, largely, I think, la the end of last summer, on carbon pricing and these border adjustment mechanisms um, that I think speak to Commissioner Place's very good uh, observation that these are the best rational response in the current framework, and also demonstrated the technical capability of PJM that um, we could definitely do this. However, unfortunately, right now, um, the trend is in the other direction at the grid operator level, as we're seeing attempts to eliminate the effect of state policies that, that are seeking to internalize a price on carbon. Um, and I was so glad to have an economist on the last panel, so there's no way I'm going to out-economist her. <laughs> um, but just to note, as Adam said, um, he phrased it as the job is to protect the market from externalities, which externalities, frankly, are a sign of a market that is not working. Um, it, they should be fixed, not protected. Um, we couldn't agree with more with a few of the spe speakers that made that point, and we look forward to working with them. But in this context of as various grid operators are seeking to actually mitigate or negate their, state, their state's policy objectives in this market, um, I'd like to highlight just that NISO is trying something else. They're rather, as Merchant discussed, um, rather than seeking to negate a state policy decision, NISO is exploring how to harmonize or to constructively use the the amazing power of the wholesale markets to help achieve these state policy goals. And I think that really is the best response in the current framework is how do we use the power of these wholesale markets to achieve and to work with these state policies rather than to continually try to pull against them. And Burchin did a great job of explaining the NISO process, so I can answer questions on that, but I will just uh, turn it over to Mark um, rather than do a worse job of explaining it. <laughs> So, well, thank, thank you, Kathleen. Um, uh, as Sarah mentioned briefly, my name is Mark Labs, and I'm uh, one of two managing directors of Modern Energy. We're an investment firm that invests in portfolios of distributed energy resources and the businesses that develop them. And we were born out of a conviction that the energy ecosystem was at the beginning of a once in a century transition. Um, there's been lots of conversation today about falling prices of various generation resources and the ways that those are affecting these markets. Um, our sense is that there's also really rapid innovation occurring in energy efficiency and in distributed storage and, and, other, and other resources at the edge of the grid that could be at least as impactful, impactful, indeed potentially more impactful than some of the changes that we're seeing on the generation side of the energy ecosystem today. If we look at energy efficiency as an example, the savings that have been produced from the transition to energy efficient lighting in many ways outstrip the changes that have taken place because of solar, for example. And we also sense that there's a range of technology innovations that are also driving transaction costs out of energy markets, um, or put more precisely, buyers and sellers of energy. Um, as we see the cost of matching someone who has an energy resource with someone who needs it, go down, it means that very small transactions that historically were uneconomical because matching uh, a residential solar home's excess capacity with someone who needs a bit more energy was too expensive a transaction to make sense. Essentially, the transaction costs swapped, swamped the value at stake. But as we get more and more efficient in matching those buyers and sellers, it makes new kinds of transactions in energy possible. And, uh, our firm has essentially invested in that in a whole range of ways, ranging from Faro Energy, a, a Latin American solar, distributed solar company that's trying to bring some of the innovations we've seen here in the United States to new markets, uh, another firm called Upside Energy that 
amongst other things, will basically purchase the excess capacity from UPS systems at data centers and sell it into markets where, where that makes sense. Um, to another firm, probably the one most relevant here, called American Efficient, that partners with utilities to develop portfolios of synergy resources that can more cost effectively meet those utilities' needs than building either new, new generation, transmission, or distribution resources. And as, you know, as I arrive today, there's a few things that are really prominent on sort of our mind as a firm and on the mind of our portfolio companies around trying to make sure that we're creating robust markets and, and sort of and robust rate designs that can enable third-party innovators that have identified these technologies and are developing folios of these resources to participate to the fullest extent they're, that they're able. At times that may be in the wholesale markets like PJM, at times that may be intermediated by some of the other folks that have joined me on the stage today who are looking for ways to as cost-effectively as possible serve their consumers. And I think as we look at some of those barriers, uh, it's unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity of the technology and uncertainty about its reliability. And I think in a range of ways, it's the job of the businesses bringing those portfolios to market to demonstrate that they can be reliable, cost-effective um, resources in the marketplace. But others center around the need for creating structures that will allow independent innovators to bring those portfolios to market. Um, will allow firms like those at this stage to contract with those third parties to acquire those resources in ways that make sense for consumers, for distribution utility, distribution operators, and for wholesale markets when it's appropriate. And we're excited to, to continue to innovate and to work with both utilities and commissioners to find ways to create new rate designs, new market mechanisms for enabling non-wires alternatives, shipped energy resources, um, to contribute something closer to their potential value uh, into the grid. Thanks. So I want to start us off um, largely in the same place that, that Kate started um, the uh, state discussion uh, just before lunch, and that's we've heard about a, a lot of um, activity, new goals, new initiatives, new programs for customers. Um, that are coming out of industry, um, both from the utility perspective and other market um, actors. And, and some of you spoke to this a little bit, but I want to put a little bit finer port, point on you know, what's driving those trends. What do you see as um, kind of pushing in that direction? Is it consumer demand? Is it market forces? Is it state policy? Is it all of the above? And, and you know, how um, are those forces interacting? I'd kind of love to hear your thoughts on that. I think the previous panel established the pattern of you have to have a three thing. So our, the answer to first half of your question of what's driving, particularly you know our greenhouse gas goals and our electrification efforts, um, is customers, customers, and customers. Um, it's consumer demand. Um, I should have brought the exact number with me, but there was recently a poll out that um, something like 70 to 80 percent of Americans expect their expect corporations to lead on climate and other carbon goals. Um, Perhaps unsurprisingly, that's higher than the percentage that want Congress to do it. <laughs> um, but it's the customers demand it. Um, however, on the second part of your question, customers demand it, but there are a number of market, market rules and public policy uh, dichotomies that work against it and that will essentially leave, that there's going to be a ceiling to what we can do in response to consumer demand while it's not what the market demands. I would just note that in some ways it feels to me like consumer demand has potentially been slowly but stably growing, but there's also been real changes in the ability to deliver on that consumer demand because of changes in prices of technology, feasibility of technology, scalability of some of these solutions. And that intersection of sort of stably growing consumer demand with technologies that make delivering on that consumer demand possible feel like they've created a, a, a tipping point for, for some new innovation. We're also seeing some uh, input from uh, investors and other stakeholders around um, our carbon <laughs> footprint and how we're managing that, both from a um, public policy perspective, but also a risk perspective. Uh, particularly European investors are uh, very keen in terms of what our overall carbon footprint looks like and how we're gonna manage it to a lower level in the future. So um, because of that, um, we've been taking more proactive steps, but I agree the customer demand is also uh, a large factor in what we're doing. Um, you're seeing a number of large corporations, or actually large and small corporations, making commitments to uh, going to effectively 100% renewable energy here in the future. And uh, 
Um, if we're not going to supply them with that electricity, someone else is. So um, we're transitioning in that mode. Do you want to weigh in? I could just echo, um, <clears throat> yes, obviously, we're seeing a lot on the stakeholder um, demands as well as customer demands. And as we've seen in New Jersey, um, just environmental policy that's going forward, cleaner energy. Yeah, so, so that's a great segue. So I wanted to ask, what's the role of policy here? Have we made a, a really clear call for, for policy to help deliver on that consumer demand? Um, Kim, you mentioned um, the need for um, a new regulatory compact. Mark mentioned um, kind of new rate designs and, and models that enable um, utilities to deliver on, on some of those um, things that customers are demanding. What's the role of policy in all of this? I think as far as, especially energy efficiency, it's definitely something that is not fully tapped within the state of New Jersey. Um, we definitely need to change the market structure right now. It really encourages um, utilities to sell more electrons. Um, and we need a new market structure that encourages utilities to implement more energy efficiency programs. And I think broadly across, depending on whether it's energy efficiency, clean generation, electrification, kind of all of the things everyone's working on, the role of, the, of policy is huge. It's the biggest one. Um, if if the, these externalities of the carbon pollution, air quality, ish, NOx, SOx, mercury, the whole shebang, um, if those were properly internalized in the market, we'd be making vastly different decisions as a grid, as companies, as a country. Um, just as but one example, um, kind of the implicit fossil fuel subsidy across PJM, when you consider the cost of just the air emissions, so air quality and, and the carbon, um, is 12 to $17 billion each year. Um, you, that obviously has a distortive effect on the market. Um, so I think policy is, is, is the answer. It has to, it has to value either positively, either positively through subsidies or negative not negatively sounds bad, but to discourage carbon. There, that carbon emissions, air, other pollutant emissions can't be free if you want the market to write, make the right decision. I think Adam said it really well um, at one point. He said, you need to tell the market what to solve for. The PJM folks and all across all the RTOs are very smart. They have very powerful tools. Um, the market is itself one of the most powerful tools humans have ever invented, but we need to tell it what to solve for. Just along those lines, I think that you know the role of public policy is uh, integrating input um, from a variety of uh, stakeholders um, based on uh, the election of public officials and developing a cohesive um, and longer term strategy to address all those concerns. And you know, one of the things we've had with both, whether we talk about um, RTOs, ISOs, um, environmental regulation, um, or just markets in general, um, you do have this you know, fractionated um, economy we live in. We have local interests, we have state interests, we have national interests. And because there's not harmonization over all those, uh, things like uh, greenhouse gas policy um, are often tackled in a piecemeal fashion. And until we have a comprehensive economy-wide solution, it's likely to continue when you see these distortions in the market um, because there's not a comprehensive response. So that's one thing my company's been a vocal advocate for is that any policy response, particularly with greenhouse gas, has to be economy-wide and has to be at the national level. Thanks, Mark. Do you want to jump in here? Um, I would just build briefly on what Scott said to say that there's also ways that um, the, the balkanization of policymaking that's resulted from a vacuum of federal policy uh, is particularly challenging for young firms um, because it means that uh, businesses that are trying to bring new technology innovations to market, whether it's on efficiency or on demand response, the list goes on, um, confront a policy or regulatory context that is highly complex and, and localized, which makes it really hard for, for those businesses to scale and bring their innovations to consumers. And so finding ways to create sufficiently consistent rules of the road <coughs> that let those businesses bring their technologies and solutions to consumers efficiently ends up being really, really important as we try and think about ways to, to deliver the, the highest quality, lowest cost, and we hope lowest emission solution to consumer quickly. Thanks. Um, so Commissioner Phillips on the, the last panel brought up the issue of balancing cost and, um, and you know, other goals that states and utilities and customers might have. Um, particularly for low-income customers or those who are maybe least likely or at least 
able to, to pay for some of these investments, um, particularly under this kind of context of policy uncertainty. How are you um, thinking about balancing that cost as you're kind of moving forward with your internal goals and um, kind of innovation in products and services? How do you think about threading that needle for the customers who maybe aren't demanding the electric vehicle charging station and um, really are just kind of worried about keeping their lights on? I think one thing that AP is doing is looking towards more targeted <coughs> programs where we're able to better align the benefits and the cost. Um, so that's targeting specific groups of consumers that might have a higher willingness to pay for certain technologies or products than others. Um, also innovative rate making structures where we can take out some of the inefficiencies and not unduly burden uh, certain customer classes with new programs. And I think you've seen a lot of interest in terms of uh, individual states, um, regulatory bodies looking at this as well as, you know, we do have an evolving grid. Um, there are new technologies that are being deployed. Um, and those benefits, you know, aren't necessarily ubiquitous. So uh, how do we carefully manage this transition in a way that makes sense while recognizing our, our environmental benefits uh, that can be achieved? Anyone else? I, mean, I think it's also important to consider or to keep in, in the front of your mind that um, low-income consumers are often the most likely to be bearing the costs of the pollution, so they will see the benefit of the, of, of the shift to a cleaner generation. Um, obviously, we want to do that effectively and efficiently, and that's why you know, we all cringe at bad policy. Um, you don't want, you know, paying for, pay, whatever you pay for an indirect policy or policy doesn't quite get what you, what you want is dollars that aren't available to do something else because that, you know, everyone's budget is limited. Um, I just would like to make sure that, you know, one thing to keep in mind as we think through these policies is that um, electrification isn't just a Tesla in every garage and a solar panel on every roof. That's not possible for everyone. So actually, that's one thing I'm really proud of, of what we've done, particularly as an example, that the SEPTA project I mentioned, um, and now I'm speaking Philadelphia. I'm sorry to everyone except Commissioner of the Place. Um, that's the, essentially the, the, the Philadelphia Regional Transit Authority. Um, but that's one way to address this, the, make sure that the benefits of electrification can be, you know, kind of incented into a lower income communities is making thinking beyond the single passenger RV or EV, sorry, um, and address using doing buses and delivery trucks and you know all of these things that tend to both serve lower income communities and be stored in lower income communities. Um, there's a real there's a real opportunity there from both a climate and an air quality perspective to tackle those those modes. Um, anybody else before I move on? I, I think we tend to also focusing more on um, energy efficiency, that we talk more about lowering bills <clears throat> versus um, looking at just the, the rate. Um, that's something that we're definitely pushing a lot. And like I said, we feel as though we have a lot of untapped um, potential for that. You know, one example kind of going off those comments is um, AP's headquarters are in Columbus, Ohio, and Columbus was awarded a Smart Cities grant from uh, Department of Energy uh, to look at um, basically uh, 21st uh, century or I guess 22nd century <laughs> technologies to uh, basically uh, modernize transportation. And uh, as part of that, we've got a number of initiatives away, uh, going on related to um, distributed uh, energy generation, uh, renewable energy, but also electrification of the transport sector. And uh, the city of Columbus has been pretty clear, and we work with the Public Utilities Commission, that you know these services need to ultimately target all uh, classes of customers, and particularly uh, low-income customers that have um, you know, different mobility needs than others. So that's something we've been kind of working on from the other side, is actually not unduly burdening customers with additional costs, but providing products that meet underserved classes and then appropriately sharing some of those costs back with the rest of the grid. So that's been kind of a unique initiative that we're undergoing right now. So on, on the topic of um, you know, distributed energy resources, we heard um, a lot earlier today about some of the, the challenges and, and opportunities associated with integrating those resources at the wholesale market level. Um, there are parallel um, or maybe different challenges and opportunities um, at the, the distribution level. Um, I know, Mark, your business is, is really focused on you know, how, do you, how do you, as you said, um, enable the, those, um, the, those transactions that maybe weren't possible um, before. Um, I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on um, 
you know, what are the biggest opportunities and challenges there um, at the distribution level? Are they the same? Are they different than what's happening at the wholesale level? Um, are they inextricably intertwined or is it something that, that um, can really be solved for at the state level and then separately um, in the markets? So they need to be kind of talking to each other about how do we get these resources on the grid in, in a way that um, is cost effective and efficient and reliable and, and meets those needs. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll chip in to start and then I, I won't venture into uh, wholesale retail territory. I'll leave that to, <laughs> other, I'll leave that to others on the panel. But, um, but what I can describe a little bit is, you know, there are ways that these distributed energy resources have capacity implications or sort of implications for what would be traditionally have been viewed as wholesale markets. And, and there's value there. But it's also worth noting that at least as much value that I think frequently goes untapped today centers on avoided distribution upgrades, um, reduced cost of operation, and, and we've struggled and we continued to work with a range of different uh, distribution operators to try and develop ways of pricing that value. Um, and that, that's challenging for a range of reasons. On the one hand, um, it's hard to determine what the avoided cost is. Um, and on the second, um, there's open questions about how to think about reliability of the distributed energy resources. If I, if I go and put a bunch of energy efficiency resources into the field that theoretically allow me to avoid a distribution grid upgrade, um, one is how much cost did I avoid, and the second is can I really depend on those energy efficiency resources to produce the savings expected because if, if I don't invest in distribution grid upgrades on the basis of an expectation that that energy efficiency is going to be there, it, it can end up, it can create a real problem for a distribution utility if suddenly demand is higher than they forecasted. And so I think that's been an, an iterative and ongoing process to try and think about how to price the value that DERs are capable of providing, especially at the distribution level, because it's, it's hard and, and doesn't have a lot of precedent, at least that we've been able to find so far. Anyone else want to jump in there? I think as you move down in scale from the wholesale um, bulk transmission system to the distribution system, the granularity adds a lot of complexity in terms of uh, what you're trying to manage. Um, there's no such thing as an average customer. There's no such thing as an average distribution circuit. Um, so we see our, you know, our company uh, through our wires business as being the best way to optimize all those uh, sources of demand and supply and um, ultimately have that kind of conduit for um, providing customers the power they want at the cost they want with the reliability they need. So it's, uh, it's a little bit unique. It's, I think, as we look for alternative ways to integrate technologies, it's, it's only going to get more complex, but ultimately, hopefully, we find innovative ways to add customer value while driving costs down. And it's kind of exciting to see some of the technologies out there and um, I guess uh, solutions out there that kind of create unique value or extract value from the grid that wasn't really apparent 10 years ago. Um, I think there's, there's some competing factors though as you know you see um, more energy efficiency you don't have that same need for distribution um, line growth or circuit growth so that's a competing factor to uh, having some offsetting investments, but electrification on the other hand, uh, particularly for vehicles, could provide a huge driver for needing new technologies to optimize that grid. So it's going to be interesting to see how everything plays out. So on the, on the last panel, um, and I forget who it was, but somebody um, made the assertion that, that all, all the activity around um, grid modernization is really being driven um, by the utilities, that, that utilities see this as, as kind of an existential need at this juncture. Um, curious, does anybody have a reaction to that? Um, um, do you feel like that is an accurate picture of, of the need for grid modernization? Is, is that um, the demand for it coming from, from somewhere else? Um, <clears throat> well, I appreciate getting the kudos for doing all that. I mean, it's not just driven by <laughs> utilities. As I said, you know, we're, it's we're, I, I'd say the number one factor as far as what we're doing is, is customer demand for both, whether it's AMI, um, you know, real-time control of their electricity, different types of payment so that, you know, you avoid some of the peak charges, um, as well as, you know, um, as you said, you know, changes to the grid that require as a basis for electrification. Um, so I don't know if it's driven just by us, but um, it is definitely, we are responding to, a, to myriad factors out in the market. Um, 
that do require um, upgrading an electric grid that in many neighborhoods in some of our major cities, Thomas Edison himself could still repair. Mark, I'd um, be curious your thoughts on um, how important is grid modernization to the, the, your business model and in the work that you're um, doing around DERs? Um, so certainly I think it varies a little bit across resource types. As we talk about distributed generation or storage or, or, or at least certain types of demand response, advanced metering, for example, is fundamentally critical. Energy efficiency is a little bit more complicated story. I think one of the things that we've been really interested in and, and, and followed closely is how can we how can we make those invest how can we make the most cost effective investments to get the um, intelligence about the distribution grid that we need in order to do these things. And I think finding ways to make those upgrades but also to do it as cost effectively as possible ends up being really, really important because um, the savings that we can generate if we efficiently upgrade the grid um, can become really valuable for investing in resources at the edge of it. Okay, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. I'm going to throw out one more topic and then I'm going to um, look to the audience. So get ready with, with your questions and, and maybe if um, somebody is ready to jump up with a microphone in, in just a minute here. Um, but b before we go out to the room, um, I wanted to bring up the topic of resilience, which I don't think I've heard um, come up on this panel yet, but came up a, a bunch in the um, earlier discussions. Um, it's a word that, that um, in my... Um, impression or experience or, or you know, observation, um, people throw out a lot, but we're often talking about different things. Um, curious how resilience as a topic is, is kind of factoring into um, your thinking, particularly um, around decarbonization goals and climate, and, and to, to what extent is, is resilience as a piece of that, and, and what piece is it? I think resilience is an important part of the discussion um, for such a critical resource as electricity. Um, you know, one of the main reasons for the modernization of the grid um, is that electricity is becoming an increasingly critical part of our daily lives, whether it's from um, efficiency improvements through process automation, efficiency improvements through digitalization. Um, electricity is critical to those things. So as we think about resilience, there's you know, a couple different factors to think about. There's proactive measures and there's reactive measures. And both of those have roles in terms of how electricity is ultimately reaching our consumers um, reliably. Um, and you know, there's different parts of the electric system. Um, the DOE uh, docket recently mostly focused on bulk electric supply, uh, which is an important component. But there's a whole bunch of other factors in resilience that we've dealt with as an industry for a number of years. Um, relating to downstream investments. So that's transmission infrastructure, distribution infrastructure, and how that infrastructure uh, interrelates with uh, the natural environment. So floods, tornadoes, hurricanes all have impacts on that. I think we've learned a lot as an industry about resilience over the years and continue to plan in ways where we can make our system even more resilient. Um, but it, it's an ongoing, I think, issue for an industry, nothing new, um, but it gets highlighted in different ways depending on the context that's brought up. With respect to decarbonization, uh, you're adding some additional variables into the system, whether it be intermittent generation, uh, different types of generation, um, that all have to be factored into that calculus. And I think as an industry, through research, uh, through public discourse, we can figure out solutions that make this the best balance of cost and benefits in that manner. Anyone else? Well, I I just agree that resilience is, in some ways, whatever you want it to be, and it's important to define it, much like it's important to tell the market what to solve for. Uh, defining resilience will will define help define the solution. Um, and to, your, to I think the end of Scott's point, I, just, I think it's important to make sure that um, I think I would give PJM a lot of kudos for tackling this question. Um, the reliability analyses and market rules are not designed to achieve fuel security in most of these jurisdictions. But I think it needs, we need to make sure that this is a broad discussion of resiliency. As you said, it's upstream, it's downstream. Um, you know, the downstream wires are in some ways the most critical and the possibly least resilient portion of the system. But I'd also just like to make sure that um, when we have these discussions that an evaluation of the emissions implications as ha make sure that this is part climate resiliency and emissions resiliency and being part of this discussion. Because um, when, you, when you don't think about that, I mean, you, you'll get a situation like happened in Massachusetts this winter during the 
bomb so cyclone followed by the polar vortex, I think is the right answer. It was really cold. <laughs> um, and those units couldn't get natural gas. And in the two weeks of oil burn, they burned as much oil as, as they had in the previous two years. And those emissions alone from those power plants in those two weeks used up some, about 5% of Massachusetts's emission budget through 2020. The whole economy wide used up by those plants in two weeks. So not including climate resiliency, whether it's the coastal flooding impacts to your downstream wires, whether it's what your a narrow definition of resiliency will do to your emissions impacts. It's important to consider the whole system holistically when you talk about resilience. Kim, any last words? Yeah, I just thinking of uh, Kathy's comment about <laughs> um, transmission and distribution lines that Thomas Edison probably worked on. <laughs> We're definitely one of those um, companies with a very old infrastructure. And Superstorm Sandy was definitely an eye-opening experience um, where we had to deal with um, reliance and resiliency with our transmission system. Um, when it came time for us to actually look at replacing some of our um, old gas pipeline, we did work with EDF in order to pinpoint and prioritize those pipes that um, probably had the larger leaks of methane. And therefore, we were able to reduce our, our methane footprint um, through that prioritization with the pipeline replacement program. Thanks. Anybody um, ready with a question? Want to jump up? <coughs> storage um, thinking how to get some <laughs> no really, I mean that is one of the good um, kind of edge technologies I think you used as the word um, that we are trying to figure out how they fit in with our utilities um, there's a number of open proceedings so I don't want to step on anything um, but we do see that as a as an important resource I'll chip in that you know I think there's a range of ways where um, chemical storage is starting to make sense in certain narrow use cases. Um, we actually think that some of the lowest hanging fruit is what we call thermal storage, uh, in some ways just a reframing of demand response. Lo and behold, if you can just cool a warehouse size freezer deeper uh, at a time of low demand and then turn your chillers off during peak demand, you get the essentially, essentially the equivalent of storage but at a much lower capex because you're just using uh, investments that have already been made more efficiently and effectively. And so we get really excited about finding ways to um, identify projects, energy resources, capabilities that have already been built frequently for some other reason and finding ways to dispatch them as storage by giving them a market price signal that they didn't have before. And as we sort of think about the lowest hanging fruit for storage, we actually aren't as focused on chemical batteries. We're focused on thinking about how we can shift time of use in intelligent ways that leverage investments that were already made for other reasons. I think the current kind of environment for talk of energy storage is driven largely by two factors. One is the intermittency of uh, renewable resources, but also just where the cost effectiveness of um, lithium ion and other kind of battery technology is. Uh, energy storage isn't anything new to our industry. We've been doing things like pump storage for uh, decades now. Um, we've also been doing demand response, which is just a form of energy storage in itself. Um, but what I see is kind of the um, you know, confluence of technologies and demand hitting the road now is, you know, there are some innovative solutions we can look to, um, battery installations to, uh, defer uh, transmission or distribution investment. Um, but there is a role for a public policy in this process in terms of how those investments are viewed and who can make those investments on the grid. So it's, it's going to be an incredibly interesting space to watch over the coming decades to see how those solutions are ultimately deployed and hopefully um, ultimately with an economic benefit in terms of uh, reducing some of those peaks and providing some value. Maybe just to build briefly on Scott's comment, I'll note that as we think about deploying batteries, so sort of sort of chemical storage, one of the things that's been a real barrier for a lot of our firms is not being able to get sufficiently granular locational marginal pricing. Um, a battery located in one place is worth much, much more than a battery located in another. And if you don't have a sufficiently location-driven price signal, it can be really hard to 
to identify optimal sites and, and go after the opportunity. And so I think finding ways to get more, pre more precise locational price signals could make a big difference to storage adoption, at least as we think about how we would enter that market and, and begin to innovate. And I would just add that <clears throat> something like a carbon price would be an ex excellent way to get some of those more geographic signals sent. <laughs> Good afternoon, Albert Pollard. Uh, if I could just ask a, a fairly vague question. Um, if you all had a billion dollars to invest in a vertically integrated utility for grid modernization, you know, how would you, how would you invest it, or at least how would you start? So you're saying as the you... <laughs> so as the utility, how would I, how would I spend a billion dollars if I had it in capital? Uh, pretend you're a public utility commissioner. I say, you know, <laughs> if you're a utility, you just want the return. Right. Um, so I, th I think the way we look at it internally is where we're adding the most customer value. Um, and customer value can come from a couple different things. That's uh, reliability, that's safety, um, that's lowering future costs. So it's balancing those things. So. It really depends on the you know unique location you're dealing with um, and the unique um, unique infrastructure in place. So a lot of parts of our system, we're spending about four billion dollars a year right now on wires investments for transmission distribution, and that's being driven by the fact our infrastructure is aging. Um, there's uh, safety concerns, there's physical concerns, um, there's reliability concerns. So we're seeing the most customer value added right now from that wires investment. Um, but that shifts. Uh, Ten years ago, it was investing in our generation facilities with different environmental regulations. We recognized there was a lot of value in those plants, but we had to spend the, the money to keep those plants online. So it ebbs and flows, but I think the wire space is where most regulated utilities are most heavily investing at this point um, because of that risk reward benefit and how that impacts the customer. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, across our six utilities, we are spending about $5 billion a year, so we're basically answering your question, I think. Um, and we are largely putting that into grid modernization, <clears throat> some <clears throat> EV and other electric transportation pilot programs, um, really really kind of essentially where we see the customer customer demand being, being strongest. I definitely think modernization of the grid, our pipelines, um, energy efficiency is a big issue as well. And I'll just I'll, I'll second energy efficiency and, and note that actually I, one of the areas that I think there's some there will be an interesting sort of narrative arc playing out over the next five to ten years, but but against investments that should begin today is I, I think there's still real potential for gains through energy efficiency. I, I think there's uh, there's a ton of relatively low hanging fruit that still hasn't been captured and there's room for innovation that can enable, frankly, non-wires alternatives, maybe, maybe, maybe redirect some of those wires investments into energy efficiency for a period of time, um, but then anticipate that uh, electrification of transportation um, is likely to, to turn that, that demand curve back up again, not that far down the road. And so following that curve of potentially the, an opportunity to get some additional efficiency reductions over the next few years and an uptick in demand, as electrification of transportation starts to get realized, um, leads to some interesting challenging challenges for distribution grid operators. But, but I think there's there's an even stronger argument for energy efficiency investments because that can enable a, a reduction in, in demand from traditional sources of load that can allow that infrastructure to then be prepared for an increase in demand um, as transportation starts to see an electrification trend. Anyone else? Hi, thanks so much. I'm Blair Beasley. I'm with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, I think you guys have had a lot of interesting comments about the role of private events in these new technologies, and I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on the role and the importance of federal R&D in spurring along some of the next generation of technologies. Maybe I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first this time instead of last, but I, I'll just, you know, we as a firm have really tried to focus that are in the field um, and, and, not, and not in the lab. And I think um, our hope and expectation, even as we think about energy efficiency, is that um, some of the lowest hanging fruit for the last several years has been uh, 
the transition from incandescent to CFL to LED lighting. Um, there's sort of a next wave of innovations around efficient electric motors, um, smart controls, et cetera, that look promising. But as you go further up that development pipeline, um, it's harder inevitably to see where those next waves of innovations will occur. But public investment in that type of R&D um, has been critical to a lot of the innovations that I just described being in the market today on investments that happened some time ago. And so continuing to feed that funnel um, feels, feels like a critical element of us continuing to see new innovations coming to market a decade, two decades in the future as they, as they move through the development pipeline. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, I think we reach further into the R&D pipeline than a, a lot of energy companies right now. Um, but the federal labs and kind of that whole ecosystem are still irreplaceable for kind of the, the new idea. Like we can take a good idea and make it scalable and get it out into the grid or out into the power plant. Um, but I think there's no one else playing that, that role of coming up with the idea to start with and kind of nurturing it in the lab. Yeah, I think particularly for regulated utilities, the risk and reward from R&D investment is um, very unbalanced. And um, that's why we've long championed uh, federal support for R&D programs because um, they're able to put the money where technologies can be developed and scaled to the point where we can make them usable because uh, ultimately we're going to get a return on our investment in capital. And um, it's, that capital needs to be something that's used and useful and uh, something in the lab isn't to us. So uh, we think the <clears throat> government can play a large role in bringing those next generations of technologies to the point where we as utilities can use them. Anyone else? So uh, just to follow on to that $1 billion question. So all of these things that are swirling around, AMI, EVs, DR, solar, so all of these things that are impacting the distribution system, if you have the money, what sort of time frame are we talking about? In your perfect world, uh, can we do this tomorrow? And then what's the instrument to get there? So in competitive spaces, we moved away from IRP. What's the, is it an individual proceeding on each one of these issues or a more global? What's the structure that gets us to those discussions? How perfect is the world? <laughs> I mean, ideally, I think if, if we take away all policy constraints for a minute in your question, it could be done relatively quickly, um, you know, probably a decade, um, just because there's a lot of infrastructure to be, to, I mean, I, and I don't, mean to, I don't mean to downplay how much, how far we've come and how ready for electrification for our EVs the grid is and will be over the next couple of years. Um, we are light years ahead of where we were even just five or ten years ago. Um, so I think given policy environment, and I'm just going to kick that to everyone else or possibly back to you, um, this could be done relatively quickly. Um, the policy signals just are not aligned right now. I guess the key question in there is what is the problem we're trying to solve? Is it we're trying to decarbonize the grid? Is it we're trying to make the grid more resilient? Is it we're trying to provide customers with additional ways to manage or use their energy? And, you know, is cost a consideration? I think cost is going to be the biggest um, hurdle in any type of um, modernization or transformation is how readily can our customers pay for it or do they want to pay for it? So. I think there's a lot of factors that kind of shape how things uh, play out over coming years. Uh, we're seeing a lot of different types of ideas and solutions being presented, um, but every customer is not the same in terms of what they want or what they want to pay for it. So um, what's going on in California is a lot different than what's going on in Ohio. And um, even within Ohio, Ohio wants different things than uh, urban Ohio. So um, it's, it's finding the solutions that best meet the customer demand, and that's going to shift over time. As investments are made, we go on to the next priority. I, am, I might take a slightly contrarian position to the framing um, of the billion dollar investment and say that in many ways as I sit as an outsider looking in and not as a regulated utility, um, I think one of the things that we've been eager to see more of is performance-based rate making, rate making that's driven by an output instead of an input. In some ways, my goal wouldn't be to try and say, you should spend a billion dollars this way and earn a regulated return on that billion dollar capex. It would be, let's define an outcome we want to see, whether it's a reliability metric or a carbon metric or go down the list. Um, 
and, and frankly give distribution utilities the opportunity to, to profit from doing that as cost effectively as possible. And, um, and I think one of the things that limits in many ways our ability to partner as effectively as possible with, for example, many of the distribution utilities in these markets is that they, they're confronted by incentive structures that center around capital expenditure um, when that may not be the, the most cost-effective way to deliver a desired outcome to consumers. Um, if I present a non-wires alternative that could, that could produce a comparable reliability, emission reduction, cost savings solution, but it implies a lower capex or potentially no capex depending on what the nature of the contract is, um, frequently we find, that, we find that our counterparties are disincentivized from working with us because of the way that their incentives are structured instead of because of the underlying economics of the solution. And finding ways to try and better align um, the distribution utilities economic interests with those of consumers in these cases I think could be really, really valuable. Other questions, Kathy? Friends, if you will be Friends, there's some. Hi, um, just going off of that last point on performance-based um, regulation, so Hawaii just passed legislation to move towards performance-based compensation and regulation of their utilities. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of get reactions from the utility representatives on the panel. I, I, I don't know if that's something you all are in favor of or have concerns about, um, but yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Oh, um, Sarah Duffy, Georgetown Climate Center. I guess I'll start. I don't have um, you know specific uh, rate making expertise, but I will say that we're you know open to innovative rate making structures, including performance based rates. I think the biggest challenge that we face as an industry is getting to make is ensuring that those performance-based rates are incentivizing the right performance. And the biggest thing, our um, biggest challenge to that is the right temporal consideration. So if you have kind of a one-year target uh, for performance, you might make different investment decisions than if you have a 40-year target. And um, for a company that's been over, around over 110 years, we've made our investments with that longer-term uh, time horizon and how do you appropriately value um, the value now versus the value in the future. And um, part of the reason our industry was regulated was to prevent um, uh, you know, misuse of resources by um, basically too many players as well as ensure that the, the customer demand was met at all times in a reliable fashion. And if you don't have the right incentives in place, you can see um, different impacts to the market. A uh, great example, PJM's capacity market only goes three years out. If you're making a 40-year investment, is three years of certainty what you need? Probably not. Um, but how do you get the market to recognize the longer-term value? So um, for every you know, problem, there's a solution, but that solution might not be an optimal one. So it's just something that needs evaluated carefully. I too am not the one you aren't commenting on rate making structures, um, but I would just like to second most of what Scott said, particularly around when we design any any standard performance based is you know it's generally preferable. You know you want an end goal. It doesn't really matter how you get there. Um, we just make sure that we are you know considering the whole holisticness you know of what what it is we mean to it what we mean to incentivize. I feel like that question is like the Russian nesting doll of the question we've been answering all day of like what exactly is PJM solving for? I think we definitely have talked about changing the structure um, to incentivize utilities to do certain things. Um, like I said right now we're incentivized to sell more electrons. Um, if we could develop a program that incentivizes the utilities to um, implement these energy efficiency um, programs. And if you do have performance metrics, that, that's definitely a positive. Other questions? I have one from the webcast. And those of you who are on the webcast, just to remind you, there is a number in the confirmation email that you got when you registered, and you can text questions to me uh, on the, in, by texting them to that number. Uh, here's the question. There were several comments about PJM and its government governance process earlier. Do the panelists have a take on this topic? 
Is the PJM process working or are reforms needed? Is that clear? Now I might be able to hear you. <laughs> I think it's clear, I just don't know the answer. <laughs> I think the one thing to keep in mind, and I'm probably avoiding the question as I probably should, <laughs> um, you know, w whether it's PGM, uh, electric utilities, other stakeholders, individual states, they're all running with different sets of rules based on their constituents and who they represent. Um, so there's not going to be a one size fits all to solution to any of these problems. Um, but hopefully everybody recognizes our broader interests and broader implications from the work that um, these bodies are doing to um, you know, meet what they perceive as a demand or a solution. Um, and that you know, hopefully collectively as a uh, group, we can work together to find that right mix because um, there's gonna be winners and losers. There's gonna be people that are happy and unhappy, um, but that's all part of the public policy process and um, all part of the process of you know, ultimately ensures our customers have reliable energy. I might just build briefly that I, I think there's a, there's a, there's probably a question about solutions that I would feel wholly unqualified to answer in thinking about governance. But um, I think it's it's been valuable across different sessions today to note that there's a range of ways that I think wholesale markets have delivered value to consumers, and um, that well well structured, well designed markets that represent as close to a comprehensive set of attributes as possible um, and, and then enable a, 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 the market to weigh those attributes against one another to try and reach sort of a, an optimal outcome based on the inputs um, can, can produce better solutions for the public. And figuring out what we can do to enable those, to, to enable market designs to become more comprehensive, to reduce the number of externalities that aren't being considered in market outcomes um, is highly likely to improve outcomes for the public. And I, I don't know what that means for governance, but I'll just say that finding ways to make our markets stronger, not by protecting them from externalities, but rather internalizing those externalities seems likely to lead to a better outcome. Uh, hi, Carl Hausk with the World Resources Institute. I'd like to put sort of a sharper climate focus on, on the long term uh, in terms of what we need to do to solve the climate problem and the role of uh, wholesale markets like PJM. Uh, as probably most, most people in the room know, when uh, we look out to, to what needs to happen over the next three decades in the US or the world, we need to electrify many end uses and then we need to build a lot of low carbon or zero carbon power plants. So it, it would involve in the U.S. the mobilization of hundreds of billions of dollars. It would require building power plants uh, at a rate uh, perhaps two or even three times higher than what we've experienced uh, in, in recent years. And so picking up on Scott's comment that, uh, that uh, we have three-year capacity markets for plants with 40, uh, 40 years of life or not, do you think that our, our current market designs in PGM or elsewhere are, are up to the task of that kind of build out if we get serious about solving the climate problem? Um, I will, first of all, I have to go ahead and agree with you that the answer is more zero carbon power and electrify everything. Um, I think the question is um, more of, do we do this in the right policy framework? Until a, you know, a meaningful price of carbon is internalized in the markets, no, I don't think so. Um, and by mar markets, I'm electricity as well as e economy-wide, I mean, I think I don't need to tell WRI that um, only putting a price of carbon into the electricity market is not the fastest way to electrify the, gen the economy broadly. Um, but I think, no, I, th I think that without incorporating the cost of carbon into the markets that we're talking about, the markets just can't solve for that. I guess my view is, you know, the current PJM, whether it's the capacity market or energy market, are solving <laughs> in the best way they can for a system we're managing today. And as we put different policy objectives uh, on that system to meet environmental objectives, perhaps, um, that system's going to evolve, and 
not to say that PJM's platform couldn't solve it in its current state, but I think it would have to evolve over time to uh, incorporate some weather, better way to whether it's price carbon or um, provide the appropriate long-term signals for an economic, economic transition uh, to get there. So uh, like anything else, it needs to evolve with the times. Other questions? Mark, I've got one for you, just to just direct it to you. Um, you brought up the performance-based uh, regulation, and typically that ends up in several different kinds of buckets. System efficiency, reliability is, is where you see it most, but then there's starting to be more and more performance-based regs that come in with respect to how well the utility is reaching out to provide other customer services, and I know that's, that's where you come in. Have you seen some performance-based regulations that, or if you had your druthers, what are some that, that make sense? Uh, is it interconnection times? Is it interconnection costs? What, what are some things that, that make sense from, from where you're coming at? Um, so the, the first confession is I've seen a lot of proposals and very few implementations. Um, the, the benefit of that, I guess, is lots of ideas. The drawback is that I don't actually know which ideas are good because they aren't, they aren't done yet. <laughs> um, I, you know, we, I think we in particular have been um, excited about the potential of looking at avoided investments in T&D infrastructure as an area where there's room for innovation and where there's a lot of ideas out there. Um, I've seen I've seen them come out of Brattle, I've seen them come out of EPRI, I've seen them come out of a range of places, um, but I, I haven't seen them implemented. And I, I think one of the challenges is trying to figure out how to, how to incentivize experimentation around sort of performance-based rates for non-wireless alternatives that um, both still make sure that we continue to meet our reliability targets um, and don't put an undue cost burden on consumers, but also recognize that um, aggressive investment in energy efficiency could lead to savings um, that far exceed their costs um, if the alternative is uh, building a new substation and a whole bunch of other investments on a circuit. And um, the other thing that I think is a, a particular challenge in that within, and, the, and folks at, at this table could speak to it better than me, is that it, it frequently involves collaboration between planning groups and ops groups within distribution utilities, which requires um, a, a somewhat exceptional amount of coordination in, in a lot of those organizations. And so I think there's both a challenge of creating a rate that aligns incentives and addressing essentially coordination issues across different parts of distribution utilities that frequently don't interact that much. I see some heads nodding. Does anyone have a, a reaction to, to Mark's observation? Probably shouldn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Hi, uh, Bill Hederman from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's more of an elaboration on what Mark just said, I, but I'd be interested in reaction to it. Uh, I, what I've seen on the demand side uh, responses is that not only are there incentive challenges within the utilities, but Perhaps even more so, I think the largest bottleneck to some of the innovative ideas have been the uh, HVAC contractors in individual buildings who don't want anyone else messing around with their box or with their contract. And I was wondering what kind of experience you've had with that in each of uh, your businesses. So it's probably worth noting that we, We've actually, we've ended up probably in a little bit of a contrarian place on demand response generally. Um, I, I think there was a lot of what we sort of think of as version 1.0 demand response that tended to involve uh, a, a guy calling a guy, calling a gal, calling a guy, calling someone who was supposed to push a button in order to <laughs> produce a demand response, uh, you know, in response to a demand response event. And um, when I talk about transaction costs that led to sort of exceptionally high friction in the market that made it difficult, those kinds of challenges were real. And I think what we're seeing today, um, 
is, for example, a transition to smart controls that can allow us to encode those dispatch events into software and, and rules-based software that can both lead to greater comfort for end users who want to know that they're still going to be able to use whatever the thing that's getting dispatched is if they need to, um, know that there's going to be bounds to those dispatch events that they're comfortable with, um, and coincidentally working closely with manufacturers of HVAC technologies, of UPS systems, of, of other dispatchable resources to embed the, the logic of dispatch into their firmware. And so I think one of the really interesting opportunities in what we sort of think of as algorithmic demand response or demand response 2.0 is that when you use a, a rules-based structure that's encoded in software instead of a sort of a higher friction, multiple human touch point model, you can end up getting greater comfort on the part of end users, on the part of manufacturers, on the part of grid operators that those, those resources are going to be reliable and that they're going to operate within parameters that are agreed upon in advance. And so I don't know that that's a silver bullet to your question, but I'll just say that I think there's ways that the, the introduction of internet-connected energy devices enables encoding logic and software that, that the whole value chain can get more comfortable with. Others want to jump in? I think we've got about five more minutes before we wrap up. I've got a question. Um, uh, a lot of you have uh, mentioned electric vehicles kind of throughout the day and you know, in the context of um, big picture decarbonization goals and, and some of the um, work that, that you're um, doing at the local distribution company level. Um, we heard from the panel before lunch that uh, Pennsylvania is trying to think about how to crack the, the chicken egg problem um, with electric vehicle supply infrastructure. I know a lot of states are, are thinking about how do we um, crack that nut and, and the VW settlement has maybe shined a light um, or, or gotten more states thinking about that um, than they might otherwise have been, um, generated a lot of excitement around electric vehicles. Um, when you're thinking about the, the challenge of, of um, that chicken and egg problem, are, you know, there, what do you think is the biggest opportunity or, or need um, that would help lay the foundation for that infrastructure? Are there um, particular states that are taking an approach to this that it's really working um, that other states could, could learn from? Are there um, things that we're not seeing that you really wish we were seeing a lot more of? Is that just the transition to Michael Tubman on the next panel? <laughs> I, know, I mean, I think Pennsylvania, um, you know, obviously we've been involved in that <laughs> of, you know, through PICO. Um, are, they're starting to take the lead. I think a lot of our cities are really looking at this as a huge opportunity to marry several issues, both, you know, climate and air quality. I think those are the biggest ones. Um, so, I mean, when you look at actual cost of ownership, to your point about, you know, what what temporal frame are you looking at? Um, they say do save customers a lot of money. It's very upfront, so that's definitely a thing to get that we need to get over. Um, and that's just, in some ways, it's a really exciting time to be <laughs> dealing with with the electricity side of it. Um, there's a look back the HVAC contractor in your example, um, but I think we are hopefully nearing a tipping point where the opportunities are outweighing the, the challenges. I would just chip in that in some ways, I think um, a lot of attention is getting paid to public charging infrastructure today, um, tied to sort of assumptions around mass market adoption of, of consumer, sort of consumer adoption of, of electric vehicles. And I think some of the lowest hanging fruit and actually some of the, the biggest opportunities for um, public support of a transition to electrification of transportation centered on fleets. And if, you know, in line with Proterra that Kathleen mentioned a moment ago, um, you know, there are ways for us to support municipalities, local governments, and others in transitioning to electrification of everything from bus fleets to police car fleets to uh, last mile sort of distribution fleets that were the, the economic case, I think, is actually more compelling today. The, the charging infrastructure implications are easier to ring fence because you, you, can, you can plan around where those vehicles recharge. 
and, and that there's real opportunities for essentially public-private partnerships to electrify public fleets that can help bring those technologies to greater scale, help reduce their costs, and, and then position them better for a, a, a wiser public charging infrastructure rollout over time. Yeah, I think it just to, when you talk about the scale of that opportunity is in some ways where I think some of the optimism comes from. I mean, to essentially electrify even just the transportation system, much less everything else, like that is a New Deal TVA scale of opportunity. Um, and while that does seem daunting, I mean, we did it at least once for rural electrification. We did it for um, cars and the gasoline fleet system, and the grid already touches almost every, every person in business in the country, so we, we have a path in. I think a lot of the work getting done now um, in terms of EV infrastructure um, is largely just priming the pump. Um, I think the transportation sector in general is going to be a lot more uncertain um, 10 years from now, uh, autonomous vehicles, um, performance of electric vehicles, the mobility model could change greatly. I think what we're doing with the investments today is seeing what works and doesn't work. Um, but we're also creating some demand by um, lowering some of those initial anxieties. But in the end of the day, I think it's the economics that's all ultimately going to be the big tipping point. And uh, hopefully by having some economies of scale, um, particularly around uh, battery, battery production, uh, getting some more comfort from the public level, I think that's ultimately going to help tip things where basically at the end of the day, the range, range anxiety, charging anxiety goes away just because the overall economics are so much in support of electric vehicles. I just echo everything that's been said. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm going to reserve the very last question for myself, but I think we have time for one more if anyone else wants to jump in. Going, going. Okay, I like to end a panel with um, a lightning round. Um, three, um, your response in three words or less, and I like to, to end on a positive note. So, um, in three words or less, what's the biggest opportunity you see for the future? Meaningful carbon policy. <laughs> uh, I agree, national <laughs> carbon policy, uh, energy efficiency, and electric vehicles. Cold fusion, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will third meaningful carbon policy. All right, I'm gonna jump in here myself. I think it's meeting evolving customer expectations. That's more words than I allow <laughs> myself, but um, um, I wanna Thank the panel, thank again the Nicholas Institute and GPI to, for inviting me um, back to, to be a part of the conversation and um, ask you all to, to please join me in thanking uh, my colleagues. Thanks.